Welcome, everybody. Um, today we have our speaker, Christopher Pascal. Christopher Pascal is a licensing manager for the University of Virginia Licensing and Ventures Group. Prior to rejoining UVA, Pascal uh, served as a licensing associate in Emory Office of Technology Transfer and the licensing associate at UVA P uh, Patent Foundation. Uh, in 2008, he became a registered patent agent with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and in 2010, he became a certified licensing professional. Um, Pascal re uh, received his doctorate in biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia, where his research focused on leukocyte adhesion and the inflammatory responses and its application to targeted drug delivery. Prior to grad school, he worked as a quality control and process engineer at Culture Pentaplast of America in Gordonsville, Virginia. Um, at Kochner, he helped implement a company-wide software program to more efficiently manufacture pharmaceutical-grade plastic products. And here um, tonight, he's going to talk to us about what we what we can do with our ideas and how to translate them into um, actual products. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> I appreciate it. Hope everybody's doing well this evening. Um, so uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the basics of intellectual property uh, and, and touch on just a bit about technology transfer, particularly as it relates to uh, the university and, and private research foundations. Um, I know the title of the webinar is I Have an Idea, What Should I Do and Who Should I Talk To? Uh, and hopefully we're going to build uh, a nice little uh, arsenal for you uh, to equip you with respect to the basics of intellectual property and, and tech transfer uh, to help answer some of your questions uh, and steer you in the right direction when you do come up with an idea uh, and, uh, and help you figure out what to do and, and who you should talk to. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I can figure out how to work this. Here we go. So some intellectual property basics. Where does intellectual property come from? Why do we care? Why is it important? Uh, and it turns out, uh, in certainly in today's knowledge-based economy, intellectual property is increasingly important uh, to businesses, to product development, especially in the health sciences arena. Uh, and David probably talked a little bit about that in, in, uh, in part one of this. Uh, so we'll get into uh, some of the nitty gritty with respect to intellectual property, why it's important and, uh, and why you should care. Um, when I teach this to my students uh, or, or give this lecture to students, I, I typically am a little more Socratic in my methodology. Um, so I, I won't ask you questions. I'll, I'll uh, stick to the slides and, and wait uh, for questions at the end. Uh, but we'll say that my students are often surprised to know uh, that in the United States, at least, in the Constitution, the Founding Fathers um, uh, wrote about intellectual property and science. And so if you look in the Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, if you remember back to uh, if you studied U.S. government or civics, uh, one of the things you learned about the Constitution is that Article 1, Section 8 enumerates the powers that Congress has. And interestingly enough, one of the powers that, that uh, the Constitution grants Congress uh, is this language, is that Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And what this means is the Founding Fathers thought that uh, the progress of science and the useful arts was so important that it should spell out in the Constitution a means to protect uh, what we now know as intellectual property. This is the birth of intellectual property and intellectual property law uh, in the United States and to some degree modern intellectual property law uh, around the world. Uh, so 250 years ago at the, at the founding uh, of the United States, uh, it was important enough to enumerate such a power uh, in the Constitution. Now, why would it be important 
uh, or why is it important to this day? And you can probably think of some reasons, uh, but here are a couple. One is intellectual property law, as stated in the Constitution, seeks to promote creativity. Uh, you as a physician or an engineer or a scientist um, have ideas about uh, devices, about therapeutics, uh, any number of things that, that you can come up with. Uh, and intellectual property law seeks to promote that creativity, to foster it and engender it, uh, and to protect uh, the ideas and discoveries that, that you come up with. So uh, the property rights granted protect uh, the, uh, in part, the creators, um, it gives the uh, creator an opportunity to recoup his or her investment, be it blood, sweat, tears, years, or dollars, uh, to invest time and energy into developing new intellectual property. Um, so for example, if you were to come up with a new um, uh, catheter um, and you spent 10 years developing it and $10 million uh, in, in research money uh, to develop it, uh, it wouldn't be fair for a competitor to come in and be able to uh, take advantage of your 10 years and $10 million investment and copy your intellectual property. Um, the, uh, the Constitution affords you, the inventor, a limited monopoly on your creative endeavors. Uh, so in part, that's why we have intellectual property. It's to protect uh, your ideas, to pr promote creativity, uh, and to encourage you to be entrepreneurial, uh, to create new things, uh, improve humanity, and, and benefit society. So I, I always tell my students, you can remember the basics and everything you need to know about intellectual property uh, if you can remember the number four. All right, so uh, David Chen has heard me say this a few times. Uh, I, tell my, I tell students to pretend you're on Sesame Street again and the number of the day is going to be four. Uh, so you can remember pretty much anything you need to know about intellectual property if you just keep in mind the number four, all right? Uh, so to start out, there are four types of intellectual property, and we're going to go through all four of them. Uh, the four are patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. So the first one we're going to look at are patents. And what is a patent? Uh, so a patent is a grant issued by the federal government giving an inventor the right to exclude others uh, from making, having made, using, selling, or importing an invention in the United States. And we're talking here about law in the United States. It's fairly similar around the globe. Um, there are some nuances with each individual country. So uh, what we'll be talking about tonight is limited to US law. If you have any questions about law outside the United States, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, but for, the mo for all intents and purposes, the, uh, the laws around intellectual property are pretty similar around the world. What's the important take home message about a patent? A patent doesn't give you a right to do something it gives you a right to exclude others from doing something. So one way to think about it is a patent is like a fence around a piece of property. Uh, it protects others from coming in your property and, and playing on your turf. It keeps others out. Uh, and so necessarily you may have to enforce your patent uh, against someone, uh, which is uh, ordinary in the, in, the, in the course of business and in, in the world of intellectual property law. So just keep in mind that a patent ex uh, gives you the right to exclude others from practicing your invention. It doesn't give you a right to do something. The other thing to keep in mind is that patents cover inventions, not ideas. Uh, and, and the difference is an idea you may have in your head but an invention is something that is either you have in your possession tangibly or you can describe it sufficiently so that 
one of uh, ordinary skill in the art can recreate your invention. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. Uh, what do patents cover? They can cover many different things, compounds, machines, processes, articles of manufacture, uh, you name it, it's potentially, potentially can be covered by a patent. It's also a financial instrument that can be sold or licensed like a piece of real estate. So the, uh, another important thing to remember about patents is they're not just a piece of paper. Uh, they can be sold, they can be licensed, they can be traded. Uh, and to get one in the United States uh, from uh, initial submission to issuance uh, costs about fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars. So you can think, uh, of course, that's about the same as a mid-size sedan. So one patent costs about the same as a car. Uh, it's not just a piece of paper. Uh, it's uh, it's a serious piece of business that protects uh, your intellectual property. Back to our number four, there are four types of patents. Uh, the first we're going to talk about is a provisional patent, and it's really a provisional patent application. Uh, a provisional patent application uh, is good for one year. It costs about $100 to file. It doesn't require any claims. It's a cheap way for you as an inventor to get something on file with the patent office that says, I invented such and such on this particular date. Uh, reserves your right for that year to figure out what you want to do with your invention, all the while protecting uh, you from competitors and, and other people who may be developing things in that particular space. We in uh, universities file these routinely uh, on a number of our inventions one, because they're cheap, but also because we have inventors who are at the cutting edge and, uh, of technology, and it may take a while uh, to develop whatever their invention is. So we're trying to buy ourselves as much time as we possibly can uh, along the development pathway. Uh, so that's a provisional patent application. Second type of patent is a utility patent, and this is probably what you think of most often when you think of patents. Uh, a utility patent uh, it covers any number of things from machines, processes, compounds, etc. Uh, they're good 20 years from filing. They're examined by a patent examiner in the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in the United States. All patent examiners uh, must have a scientific or engineering degree or a minimum amount of science and engineering training. Uh, so um, patent examiners are, are typically well qualified scientists and engineers reviewing um, uh, patent applications. And again, the cost is typically higher than, than most folks realize. It's about fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars to file, prosecute, and get to issuance uh, a utility patent in the United States. Third type of patent is called a design patent. A design patent protects the aesthetic characteristics of an object. Uh, and it's granted to a new or original ornamental design for something that is made by man. Uh, and they're good 14 years from the date of issue, so a little bit different from uh, a utility patent. Uh, some famous design patents, so I, I know you, you may be on your phone now or you may be uh, listening by computer, but if you have a cell phone handy, um, and if you have a, uh, some of you probably have iPhones and some of you probably have non-iPhones, Samsungs or Droids or whatever the case may be, but when you get a chance, look at your phone, and if you've got an Apple phone, you will notice that on your home screen where your icons are, on an Apple phone, all of the icons have rounded square edges, and all the icons are uniform. And on a, a non-iPhone, you will notice that the icons can be different shapes uh, and, and patterns. Um, the reason that is is because Apple has design patents on the rounded corner 
icon on all of its phone and products. And it sued Samsung a number of years ago uh, for infringement of, of its design patents and won a billion dollar settlement against Samsung uh, based on just what uh, the, the Apple iPhone looks like. Uh, and the reason for that is Apple is protecting uh, the image of its iPhone. So it has design patents to protect what the iPhone looks like so that consumers know the difference uh, between the iPhone and the Samsung Galaxy in the commercial marketplace. Uh, Apple spent a long time building uh, its reputation and in part that is protected by design patents. The car manufacturers like Ford Motor Company are also big holder design patents and they have design patents on the hoods, the front bumpers, the side view mirrors on their cars because they're protecting what their cars look like. Uh, so for example, the Ford Mustang, there are a number of design patents on it uh, because Ford is protecting uh, the look and feel of a Ford Mustang. So when you, uh, when you look on the road, you can pick out a Ford Mustang pretty quickly from other types of vehicles. So that's a design patent. Uh, fourth type of patent is called a plant patent. Uh, our university doesn't deal uh, in, in plant patents. We don't have an ag school, but you will see uh, some schools uh, and the Monsantos of the world uh, will on occasion get plant patents. Uh, and these are non-tuberous plants that can be asexually reproduced, so different varieties of of plants, uh, you can get plant patents. Uh, another way, of course, to protect your plant, plant patents is with utility patents. Uh, Monsanto does this as well on uh, the DNA uh, or nucleotide sequences of uh, the seeds they use for their crops. Requirements for patentability. Now, this is with respect to utility patents because utility patents have the, the highest bars to patentability. Design plants and provisionals, not as much. Uh, and utility patents are really the meat of the patent world in the United States. So again, there are four requirements to get a utility patent in the US. The first one is, which may seem obvious, uh, it has to be useful or have some sort of utility. Uh, being new is not enough. It, uh, it has to have some sort of use. Admittedly, this is a fairly low bar, but we do on occasion see uh, rejections of patentability uh, based on inventions not being useful or not having any known utility. Uh, but in, in large part, this is a fairly low bar to uh, traverse. Second requirement uh, for patentability in the United States is absolute novelty. Uh, and this means your invention must be new. It can't have been created before, all right? Uh, third requirement for patentability is it has to be non-obvious. What that means is um, it's okay to, to create an invention by combi combining two or more uh, known uh, devices or uh, objects, whatever the case may be, but they have to be combined in an unobvious way. And this is the gray area in patent law, uh, and often it boils down to a negotiation with the patent examiner to determine whether your uh, invention is a non-obvious improvement over whatever may be in the prior art. Uh, fourth requirement to patentability is your invention uh, and, and patent application must be enabling and must have sufficient written description. One of the trade-offs with uh, patent applications is you get a limited monopoly. So for utility patents, they're good for 20 years. But after 20 years, they're opened up uh, for the public to use them freely. And in order for the public to benefit after your monopoly, your invention has to be described well enough for someone of ordinary skill in the art to be able to recreate it uh, or to build it. Uh, the public can't benefit if uh, it can't access whatever your invention is after the monopoly is over. So the patent office requires you 
to sufficiently describe your invention for one of ordinary skill in the art to practice it, to build it, uh, to, to recreate it. And that's the trade-off for you as the inventor. Um, so those are your four requirements uh, for patentability to be able to get a patent in the United States. Second form of intellectual property uh, are copyrights. And you may be familiar with these as well, especially if, if you know the music and video world uh, pretty well. What is a copyright? Uh, a copyright is a right that protects original works of authorship than a tangible medium of expression. Now, what in the world does that mean? Uh, so in order for you to get a copyright on something that you've authored, it has to have at least an element of originality and creativity, and it must be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. A tangible medium of expression is nothing other than a piece of paper, uh, a computer, uh, concrete for sculpture, film, DVD, cellulose, anything where your creative work is fixed, uh, copyright protection is automatically granted. So unlike the patent world where you have to submit a patent application uh, and have it approved by a patent examiner, you are automatically afforded copyright protection as soon as your work of authorship is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Copyrights are good for a very long time. They're good for at least 70 years beyond the life of the author. Uh, and you can register them if you want to with the Library of Congress. So it's a, it's a different governing body. It's not the US Patent and Trademark Office. That office deals with patents and trademarks. Uh, the Library of Congress and the US Copyright Office handle copyrights in the United States. Uh, Copyrights do not protect ideas, but the creative expression of those ideas. Again, it must be original, it must have come from the author, uh, and it must have some element of creativity. So there's a famous court case that said um, a man who went around his town creating the first phone book put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into building the phone book but he was not afforded copyright protection on the phone book because there was no element of originality or creativity. Collecting a bunch of phone numbers uh, doesn't rise to the level of being creative. It does rise to the level of working hard but not being creative, so he wasn't able to copyright uh, his phone book. All right, third type of intellectual property that we're gonna talk about are trademarks. And often there's a lot of confusion with trademarks, and, and hopefully we can clear uh, some of that up. What are trademarks? Trademarks are non-functional words, logos, slogans, symbols, designs, or combination that distinguish a product or service. And you all are, are very familiar with many of these. So you know uh, Google, you may know IBM. I've actually got the old IBM uh, logo up there, uh, the old GE logo. Uh, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Apple, Nike, uh, you know these logos and symbols. Those are um, logos, words, or slogan symbols that are able to be trademarked. Um, how long are they good for? Uh, trademarks are typically good for 10 years and they're renewable, so you can renew them indefinitely. Unlike copyrights and patents that have uh, limited term uh, trademarks uh, can be renewed every 10 years. There are four types of trademarks and four levels of protection uh, in United States trademark law. The first type of trademark is called the arbitrary or fanciful trademark. And this is a trademark that bears no logical relationship to the underlying product or service. Uh, and this can be slightly confusing, but here's how you can think of it. Before Google, the word Google had nothing to do with search engines. Google uh, trademarked the name, and the consuming public now associates the word Google with search engines. Uh, the word Exxon has nothing to do with gasoline or petroleum, other than the fact that Exxon is a company 
that uh, refines and uh, transports gasoline around the world. Um, the, these types of trademarks are given a high, agree, high degree of protection uh, because there is no uh, direct or logical connection between the trademark, the slogan, or the word, and the underlying product. The next level down in the trademark world uh, is a suggestive trademark. And this is a trademark that evokes or suggests characteristics of an underlying product. So at summer season, and if you've been to the beach, you may have used copper tone sunscreen. Uh, and copper tone, the word copper tone, is a suggestive trademark because there's the underlying modest de degree of logical relationship between copper tone sunscreen and the bronzing of skin. Uh, so that, that's the best example I can come up with for a, a suggestive trademark. Like the arbitrary or fanciful trademark, these are also given uh, a high degree of protection. Third type of trademark is a descriptive trademark. And this is a trademark slogan word uh, that directly describes a characteristic uh, or the product itself or the underlying quality of the product. Uh, so one example here is all brand cereal. All brand cereal is made of all bran, uh, and hence it is a descriptive trademark describing directly the underlying product. Uh, it can be difficult to obtain trademarks on descriptive trademarks, so that you can only uh, obtain trademark protection once the uh, the consuming public associates that particular product or service or the quality with the particular mark. So it has to acquire what's called secondary meaning in the marketplace. And oftentimes this can be adjudicated or argued with the trademark office. Like obviousness in the patent world, uh, it's the gray area in trademark law. Uh, fourth type of trademark is afforded no trademark protection. It's called a generic trademark. Uh, and it, it describes generally the category uh, to, uh, in which the underlying product or service belongs. So for example, you can't trademark the word computer for uh, a series of products or uh, a class of products that are computers. You can trademark the word Dell with respect to computers, because Dell is Michael Dell's last name. There's no logical relationship between the word Dell and computer, so it's given an arbitrary trademark designation. But if Michael Dell had tried to trademark uh, the word computer uh, for the computer industry, it wouldn't have worked because it would have been a, a generic trademark. Obviously, he was smart enough not, not to take that route, uh, and he's been pretty successful with the word Dell. So those are trademarks. Uh, fourth type of intellectual property we're going to talk about are trade secrets. And what are trade secrets? They can be, again, any number of things, formula pattern, uh, manufacturing process, a method of doing business, know-how, uh, something that gives its holder a competitive advantage. Uh, probably the most famous trade secret on the planet, or at least in the United States, is the recipe for Coke. So legend has it that no one person knows the trade secret recipe for Coke. Um, and I, it may still be true, I'm not sure. Uh, but because no one knows it, it's still a trade secret. How long is a trade secret a trade secret? It's as long as you can keep it a secret and you have to take certain measures to keep it a secret. So, uh, for example, employees who work for Coca-Cola sign non-disclosure agreements uh, that say they won't divulge uh, either half or part of the recipe of Coca-Cola. I worked for a company called Klockner Penaplast that manufactured plastic. Uh, they had their formulations stored on two computers that were locked behind four uh, locked doors in a lab behind two security gates. And uh, there was a guy who pretended to be an employee 
who tried to break in and steal the formulations off of the computers, uh, and he was prosecuted for attempted trade secret theft. Uh, so that you know that really goes on um, in corporations on occasion. Um, so companies do have to take precautions and measurements to protect their trade secrets because they're only secret as long as you can keep them a secret. It, uh, trade secrets don't preclude you from reverse engineering. So if you were able to reverse engineer the formulation for Coke, you could do so and you wouldn't be infringing on Coca-Cola's uh, intellectual property rights, at least with respect to the trade secrets uh, on their formulation for Coke. Technically speaking, all intellectual property starts as a trade secret and you as the inventor or the author have to determine what's the best course of action to protect your intellectual property. Oftentimes it's beneficial to trade disclosure to cover it uh, with a patent. Uh, sometimes it's a work of authorship that's most easily covered uh, by copyright. Sometimes it's a trademark and sometimes it's more beneficial to the company uh, to keep the invention under wraps and to keep it as a trade secret. Uh, and there's uh, calculus that goes into that. Um, and, and I can certainly answer any questions if you have any, uh, but you as the inventor have to determine the best course of action to determine uh, how to protect your intellectual property. So that's IP in a nutshell, the, uh, the basics. Now I want to turn uh, to uh, technology transfer and technology commercialization and just hit on a couple of high points. Um, with respect to universities, small businesses, and private foundations that uh, do research, for example, the Scripps uh, research, research Institute, uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, those sorts of entities, um, what do you, as a university or a research foundation, how do you protect uh, and manage uh, your intellectual property? And the governing act with respect to IP management that comes out of universities, and particularly inventions that are developed with federal funding, uh, is governed by uh, an act called the Bayh-Dole Act. Uh, the Bayh-Dole Act was implemented in 1980, because at the time, uh, pre-1980, inventions developed with federal research dollars were owned by the federal government. And there was no efficient way to commercialize uh, those inventions. So many of the patent applications literally sat in drawers and shelves, uh, and there was uh, nothing going on with respect to commercializing those technologies. So what Congress did in 1980 was created this act that gave uh, universities and research foundations and small businesses the opportunity to own intellectual property created with federal dollars in exchange for the federal government uh, getting some rights uh, and the public getting some rights in and to uh, those inventions. Uh, so why was the Bayh-Dole Act enacted? Well, here's the language from it. Uh, but in essence, it was an effort to promote the commercialization and public availability of inventions made in the U.S. by U.S. industry and labor, be it researchers, academics, scientists, uh, or engineers. Uh, and um, what, in essence, did it do? It, it again, granted ownership of IP uh, in exchange for diligent commercialization by universities, foundations, and their respective licensees and partners uh, of intellectual property. So uh, universities and foundations, inventions that are developed with federal funds can elect to retain title to inventions. Uh, they're encouraged to collaborate with uh, corporate par partners and commercial entities uh, to commercialize technologies uh, universities are expected to file patents on patentable technologies, uh, and the government retains a non-exclusive license uh, to practice the patent, and it also retains what are called margin rights. And what that means is the federal government can come in uh, and take 
rights to your invention or patent application covering inventions in the case of an emergency. Uh, in the 36 years since Bidol was enacted, uh, March End rights have never uh, been exercised, uh, and I don't anticipate it being exercised anytime soon. The Economist about 15, 13, 14, 15 years ago said of the Bayh-Dole Act that it was possibly the most inspired piece of legislation to be enacted in America over the past half century, and they called it innovation's golden goose. What, in part, what it led to was an unleashing of the biotech industry uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, so uh, Genentech uh, coming out of Stanford, uh, and then in the IT world, Google. Uh, coming out of Stanford, and some of those early biotech companies were university spinouts, and they may never have been created uh, without the Bayh-Dole Act and without uh, the ability of universities to commercialize technologies. Uh, so over the past 35 years, uh, many folks believe the Bayh-Dole Act has fueled the growth of the biotech industry uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, so what are tech transfer offices? So I work in uh, the University of Virginia's tech transfer office. What do we do? Uh, well, here's our mission statement. And most universities, uh, their mission statement is going to be fairly similar. They're going to have their uh, own uh, nuances. Uh, but generally speaking, a university tech transfer office uh, is charged with disseminating the results uh, of intellectual discovery and creative endeavor, be it through commercialization, through business development, uh, through intellectual property management, uh, through licensed transactions and negotiations, uh, and uh, providing customer service to uh, faculty and staff uh, at, uni at universities. The basic process, so if you are in a university, if you're at a foundation, uh, if you are ever uh, a faculty member at a university, this is the basic process you're going to see uh, when it comes to tech transfer within the university. So here, we're, we're starting to get into uh, a little bit, what do I do if I have an invention? And this is probably what you're going to see. Uh, you disclose your invention, to the tech transfer office. Uh, it can be a paper, it can be a manuscript, it can be a presentation, it can be a grant application, uh, it can be a napkin drawing. Uh, invention disclosures come in many forms and fashions, uh, typically uh, in written form with supporting drawings. Uh, and what is your tech transfer office going to do with it? They're going to assess it on uh, a number of different metrics. Uh, what does the intellectual property landscape look uh, look like around this piece of uh, around this invention? Is it something that's patentable, copyrightable? Uh, is there prior art, uh, et cetera? What's the technology development stage? Is this at a proof of concept? Uh, do we need to find translational research funds uh, to support uh, a proof of concept study to get it to the point where a potential partner is more interested in it? What's its risk profile? Uh, this comes up in the health science arena routinely, especially in, in therapeutics and diagnostics and medical devices. Uh, is this something uh, that's a therapeutic that's going to require uh, lengthy clinical trials? Is it a medical device that can take the 510K pathway, or is it a PMA pathway? Um, and then what's the commercial opportunity? Uh, what does the market look like for it? Is there an unmet need or is there pain in the marketplace for this particular invention uh, that we can exploit? Uh, and we solicit feedback from our corporate partners uh, in their respective spaces to try to understand uh, what the market may be thinking about this particular invention. And then we share that feedback with our inventors uh, to help them, you know, for example, iterate on their ideas. So typically the first idea is not the one that's going to make it to market. That just gets the ball rolling uh, for medical devices. Uh, for example, you may have to iterate numerous times from your original idea 
to find something that the market finds useful that is free and clear from an intellectual property perspective that is far enough down the technology uh, development pathway uh, to garner interest uh, and that affords an attractive risk profile from an FDA and regulatory perspective. Uh, and this is our basic process at UVA. Uh, we get a disclosure and then we determine whether it's something that's ready for commercialization or that still needs a little bit of work or we may get some pieces of intellectual property that are ready to sell uh, immediately. So for example, uh, in the life science space, uh, antibodies and research reagents uh, that are sold by companies like Millipore or Sigma, we may be able to put uh, some opportunities directly into those catalogs, begin selling them uh, immediately and deriving royalties from sales of those products. So now we come to the last slide, hopefully uh, trying to address the, the question that we started off with. I invented something, now what do I do? Uh, and I wish I had a profound answer for you, but really the, the answer is, especially if you're in residency right now, you're likely at, uh, you could be at a research university or a hospital that does research. The, the all major research universities in the U.S. and all of the major uh, research institutes have tech transfer offices. So I would encourage you to contact uh, your tech transfer office uh, and just open a dialogue uh, and tell them that you've been working on something, you've got an idea, and you want to meet and talk to them uh, and see how they can help you. Uh, if you're at uh, a hospital or a medical center uh, that doesn't have a tech transfer office, feel free to contact me offline and I can direct you uh, to, uh, to someone who can help. There are uh, independent agents out there uh, that are good, uh, that can help inventors like you, uh, but you have to be aware there are also uh, some, some not so uh, great players out there who are preying uh, on your lack of knowledge in the, in the IP space. So hopefully you're now well equipped and armed uh, against those folks, but I would say if you don't have a tech transfer office to lean on, uh, contact me and I can help you find someone. And I'll put my contact information up at the end. Um, and, and the reason I say contact your respective tech transfer office is uh, your institution's policies are going to be slightly different from everyone else's. Uh, and so check with your respective institution uh, so that you're um, uh, working under the policy uh, where you're employed. Uh, and if you have any questions or are interested in uh, IP and, and technology commercialization, I've put up uh, some resources here that you can check out. So uh, the USPTO's website, uh, our the tech transfer, our, our university tech transfer has a trade association called AUTUM, A-U-T-M, uh, and that's a great website for learning kind of the nuts and bolts of university tech transfer. Um, if you are interested in uh, filing a patent, drafting a, a, a patent application, or licensing your invention on your own. If you're an independent inventor, there are three great books uh, that will get you pretty far down the road. One's called Self by David Pressman. Uh, another's called Profit from Your Idea by Richard Stem. Uh, and the third's called Invention Analysis and Claiming by uh, Ron Slusky. Uh, I've got all three books and can attest uh, that they're great resources for the independent inventor. And with that, I'll stop and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Pratt. Yes, uh, okay, sorry, Dr. Okay. No, no, I was just going to say, just to wrap it up, um, you know, this, this two-part series, um, you know, Chris and I have been working for years, and he's um, a fantastic resource. And I've heard this talk a number of times, and I always still learn um, a lot of the uh, 
the nuances and the details. So um, hopefully that was that was a little was a bit of information, but hopefully that's helpful. And um, yeah, open up to uh, questions, Chris. If you can see on our dashboard, there's a couple of questions that were posted, but Lindsay might read them out. Um, so yeah, take it away, Lindsay. Thank you, David. Sorry for interrupting. Um, thank you, Dr. Pascal, for the informative talk. We do have a couple questions. First one is, I understand that obtaining a patent can take years. Is, if you have a provisional patent on the medical device, um, do you have one year for to obtain a utility slash design patent? That's a great question. Yeah, so um, two parts to it. One is there's no such thing as a provisional uh, on a design patent. If you, um, if you want to file a design patent, you just file a, a design patent application. Provisionals cover utility or, or convert to utility applications. Uh, a provisional is good for one year and then you file uh, your utility application within that one year. Uh, and you can file it all exactly one year to the day after you file your provisional. And then from there, it takes about, depending on how well the Patent and Trademark Office is staffed, it can take three or four years uh, to get it issued from that point. So you're looking at a timeline from first submission to issuance of about three to five years. Great. Okay, here's the, the next question is, would it be useful to pursue the uh, patent, patent agent bar exam as an MD innovator? Oh, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, you can do it. It's 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 certainly feasible. Uh, I assume if you've got your MD, you've already passed your board, so I would put that as the higher priority. Um, but you can do it. I studied on and off for about a year for it. Uh, and passed it on my first try. The pass rate for that exam is about 40%. Uh, so it's not necessarily an easy exam, uh, but uh, if you get the old tests and the appropriate study materials, uh, you know you can probably study for it in a few months with some uh, concentrated effort and pass it. Um, unless you're going into patent prosecution or you're really interested in filing your own patent applications, it, it may or may not make um, a, a ton of sense. Uh, it really just depends on, on what you're interested in doing. Okay, great. Um, so for those of our listeners who are not at an institution uh, with the tech transfer office, you mentioned private tech transfer uh, companies. What are the costs associated with those? It, again, it's going to depend, and um, uh, I, it, it's one of those things you'd have to get a quote to know for sure. I, I can't say for certain uh, how much it would be. It, it depends on, on too many factors. I would be prepared, though, uh, to, to spend some money unless you can find a contingency firm uh, that will do uh, the work for you in exchange for a share of royalties, which is essentially how the university is set up. Okay. So, uh, next question: um, Are patents covered? Uh, patent, I'm sorry. Are patents covered federally or internationally, or is this a separate process? If so, what are the steps and benefits? Oh, uh, that's a great question, and I didn't hit on it. Um, so you can protect yourself internationally by filing what's called a PCT application. PCT stands for Patent Cooperation Treaty. You have to file the PCT uh, at the end of your, uh, or within the one year from your provisional if you filed a provisional, or it can be your first application as the utility application. Uh, PCTs are covered by the world property organization so most countries around the world are member organizations and by virtue of uh, a treaty uh, on this subject uh, countries agreed to preserve uh, patent rights in their countries uh, for a period of 18 months from the PCT filing uh, and what that does is if you file a PCT it reserves your right to file in all member countries 
within that 18 month window and then you have to uh, nat what's called nationalize your PCT uh, in whatever countries you de decide to seek uh, patent protection. So really the, the, the quick answer to that question is uh, you can protect yourself internationally by filing uh, what's called a PCT application. Great. Um, any advice for picking a good protectable name for my innovative innovation or business? Yeah, so that, uh, if you've got a business, I would talk to uh, an attorney who is well versed in uh, small business incorporation and, and operation. Uh, that's a little bit outside the scope of, of intellectual property. Uh, a quick and dirty way to set something up would be to form an LLC and to assign your intellectual property to that LLC. And what exactly is an IP audit? An IP audit. Um, uh it 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 kind of depends on what your what the context is uh one form of an ip audit is uh to de try to determine uh if a product incorporates a piece of intellectual property so for example um if a product is covered in whole or in part by an issued patent um, that's one form of an IP audit. Okay. So um, you spoke about copyright laws. Um, can you give an example of this in the medical world? Would this be akin to publishing a, uh, intellectual property in a journal? And how can this be merged with patent law if you bring a manuscript to your tech transfer office? Yep. So um, typically, so textbooks, uh, and scholarly works are, are what we call scholarly works in the academic world and uh, faculty and staff and, and physicians typically uh, take all right title and interest to that. Um, they may either grant a license or assign the copyright uh, to the publisher, but the university or research foundation typically doesn't assert ownership uh, in things that it deems scholarly works. Um, uh, again, copyrights are covering um, uh, something that's original, creative, and fixed in a tangible medium, whereas a patent would be covering an invention that may be described in a, in a manuscript or paper. Uh, so it wouldn't be the paper itself that the patent is covering. It's whatever the invention is that's being described in that paper. Okay. And then your last question is, um, if I'm coming up with an idea, do I really need um, an IP lawyer? Not early on. Uh, you, can, you can do a lot on your own. Uh, if, it, if it's something that you think is valuable, uh, it is probably going to get to the point where you may need an IP attorney. And it's not necessarily on the drafting of the application, but once the patent office begins to examine and review your application, they're going to send you responses and rejections uh, to which you have to respond in order to keep it alive. Uh, and there's an art to responding. Uh, you've got to know the case law uh, around intellectual property and the arguments that you can make uh, to persuade the examiner. So at that point, it's probably good to uh, at least have an IP attorney uh, around. Um, one more question, I apologize. So I do not have a tech transfer office at my university. Could I join another university's transfer office? There are, uh, depending on what, what city you're in and what the, uh, what the, you know, if it's a medical center or something, some, excuse me, some universities have partnerships with surrounding medical centers uh, and they will manage uh, their intellectual property for them. Uh, so I would check with, uh, another place to check would be um, if you're at a medical center, 
that has a research office or a sponsored programs office, or there's a vice president for research, you can contact that department and they may be able to, to steer you in the right direction. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And if there are no more questions, we can let Dr. Pascal go. We very much appreciate you spending an hour of your time here with us, um, explaining this to us. It's been incredibly informative. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay, you too. Thank you.